Welcome to the Armada Podcast with your host, Kalorn. You had no idea what you were getting into when you agreed to this interview, John. Oh my god. Well, um, the sad thing is I did, and I'm just going with it because it's great. Fox Omega. Nope, I have my own isolated hot take about this. You ready for this? Voldar, I hardly know her. And Juliet Whiskey. But we're going to go for it anyways because I will not be silenced. <laughs> and now, the Armada Podcast. What is up, all you admirals out there? It is I, Juliet Whiskey, and welcome back to the Armada Podcast with my host, Paul, three time champion of the world, Kalorn. I'm just not going to fight it anymore at this point. Don't fight it. Don't fight it. Let, shh, let it happen. Shh, just let it happen. Fox, right hand of God Omega. And. Our special guest for the night, all the way from Ion Radio, John. I, I feel like I feel John. John, you got to give me a little bit more than just that. Give me, give me. Yeah, you know what? Somebody give this man a nickname. I, I have a nickname, but uh, Trueborn JCT is what I go for with all my like Xbox and Discord stuff. But I just go by John. You can just refer to me as John. It's very nice for you guys to have me on the show. Thank you. Is it is it Little John or Big John? I mean, are we are we going? Uh... <laughs> Technically, I was always nicknamed growing up Big John, but I'm the fourth John, and my kid's the fifth John with different names. So there's lots of Johns involved. So the fourth, but the truest John, John from Ion Radio. Welcome back to the show, everybody, and thank you all for showing up. How's everybody been? How's the last week? You know, the usual pleasantries. I'm alive, despite your attempts to smite me through God's wrath. Uh, my internet barely works, so we'll see how this goes. But don't, dude, there don't were literal explosions. There were literal, literal explosions outside my house, and I got calls from my internet provider. Like, uh, don't look outside, but you don't have internet right now. Okay, bye. And they just hung up. And I was like, is this a crank call? It turns out it wasn't. I didn't have internet for days, dude. And now, I don't know if I should take it off my Discord well, handle or what. It's all Whiskey's fault. It's all Whiskey's <laughs> it fault. It is. It is. My <laughs> wife blames you because she can't watch your shows. So you can tell your wife that. So there you go. Well, I'm sorry. Like, I wasn't going call to call you that this time, but it's on your freaking Discord handle now. So I'm just like, so do I call it, call him that or not? So we're going to find out. I, I think it was a precursor when my internet didn't work initially coming in that I shouldn't. But we're going to go for it anyways, because I will not be silenced. Anyways, and today we actually, actually, ladies and gentlemen, we have our very first ad. Run it. Okay, really, there's not, not going to be a cut to the side. Anyways, greetings, Star Wars players. About a week ago, Golden State Games opened for registration for our World Qualifier events for Armada, X-Wing, and Legion in the San Francisco area. Since then, we've already hit 25% of our capacity. Uh, blah, blah, blah. See, this is why I was just going to swing it. This is why I was just going to go with what I got. Anyways, Golden State Games is sponsoring this event. We will have a special code in the Gobbly Goop in the show notes and in the comments down below. So if you get a chance, click on our special code. And Kalorn, tell the special people what the special code does. So you do get, a, a, what is it, $5 off or something? Uh, yeah, $5 off a discount or uh, you're signing up for Golden State Games for, uh, for any of the three events. Uh, that is going to take place uh, November the 5th and 6th in Antioch, California. Uh, and uh, there will be more information about uh, places to stay and and, place, and where it's going to be and all that, that jazz uh, coming out. But uh, we, we were asked to pro provide this information by Karnak, uh, who will has kindly agreed to be on the show with us next week as well. So uh, if you guys are in the area or want to show up for a world qualifier, if you're looking for one of those world's tickets, I am very much going to try and be there at Golden State Games. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to see you there and, and you guys can get a couple bucks off uh, of your registration as well. 
So you heard that, ladies and gentlemen. Here's your opportunity to take down the three-time world champion, Kalorn. Make sure you go to www.gamescapesf.store slash golden dash state dash game. Anyway, you know, John, Fox is going to get 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 uh, Fox is going to have you smited by the Lord Almighty. I'm just going to be smited by the various people of Armada uh, competitive community, and I don't know which one's worse. I'm literally dying. I can't believe this joke has lasted this long. And if he wins, guess what? Four time world champion. I will not stop. You cannot stop me, John. How was he, your week last week? I'm sorry for bringing you into our chaos, but welcome uh, to the show. It's fine. Um, my week was good. Um, it's been busy getting back into the swing of things after Gen Con. That is awesome. All right, now time to the primary stuff. Once again, welcome. And on today's episode, we have John's interview, Gen Con top eight, and my favorite segment. Hot take 30. From here, I'm going to hand it to the wonderful, the amazing, the right hand of God, Fox Omega. If you guys hear like a suspicious loud explosion (laughs) over the next couple minutes, it's because of all of the blasphemy coming from this podcast. All right, John, welcome to the podcast, dude. I've got some questions to ask you. We like to kind of dive into uh, your brain and see what kind of armada player you are so the first question i'm going to ask is how long have you been playing the game so i started playing the game um right when it came out uh it was right around the time that i I actually started playing board games and like miniature games and like that um in my quote-unquote adult life you know as i start buying all these plastic toys um so i was following things and as soon as the game released i purchased it and i kept buying it ever since even though i haven't really played played um because i started off and i didn't really like the group that i was around at this game store and uh i stopped playing until like uh carillion conflict came out so haven't stopped playing since carillion conflict but i was technically in it since the beginning nice yeah what 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 are some of your favorite board games um let's see i think one of my favorite like here's the problem is the older you get the more you can't even play them which it becomes really really frustrating correct yep i feel that <laughs> and i i really felt that when i was at gen con and i was walking around i'm like that would be fun to buy i don't have time <laughs> <laughs> half of like half of my favorite board games i have in my house i can't even invite people to play because it's like man I love it, but to you, it's going to be spreadsheets, the the board game. So I, I don't know if this is going to be any fun at all. But yeah. I, I literally bought uh, what was it? Um, what's the Twilight Imperium? I bought the big Twilight Imperium box, and I've literally never gotten a chance to play it because to play it takes eight hours, and I don't have eight hours anymore. And you know, we've been trying to put together a D and D campaign with Fox and a couple other peoples, and we we just can't seem to make it work. All those world championships One. you're knocking down keep you from being able to. Get a, oh, clear, uh, yeah. Well, I, I, yeah. I, I, I mean, your your time as the right hand of God is clearly more important than board games. The amount of times I've ascended this past week. World rings. <laughs> but don't 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 sit there and yell about spreadsheet simulator. Oh, this will be spreadsheet spreadsheet simulator to you. I played Eve. That is the epitome of spreadsheet simulator. And I, the only reason why I stopped is because I had to adult. Adulting's hard, so we feel you, John. That wants uh, internet hugs. Yeah. Um, right now, I actually got the expansions for the game that I do try to play at least once a year. Isn't that sad when it's like a once a year thing? But Star Trek Ascendancy, I don't know if you guys have heard of it or played that. Yeah. That's oh my gosh. Yeah. That's great. Mm-hmm. I, I, my favorite game is um, Food Chain Magnate, and I get a bunch of crap about that uh because i wonder I, why that is i run restaurants mm. and everyone's like are you just working like is this working work the board game for you and i go every hey, everybody shut up this is fun for me but anyway do, do you come home and play that game where di- it's a dying dash or whatever it is where you like come into like you, you have to hand out food at home too i come home and my internet explodes so uh, it's i don't know there's a lot of explosions happening around my house <laughs> i'm my laughing so God. hard over here <laughs> All right, next question, John. Uh, what would you say is your play style? Um, I don't really think I have necessarily a play style. Like a lot of people, they might just play a single faction or things like that. But um, with what we do on Ion Radio, we have a different list every single week. So 
I enjoy like the aspect of the game that I enjoy the most is list building. So I will build a list, play it once, and then that was fun. Move on from there. So I think that would be my play style is like a one of like a lot of one off type lists that I'm just trying to do a certain like gimmick or something janky and then uh, retooling with a different commander for something else. So would you say you you, you fly uh, what's the what's the, the junk drawer method? Yeah, I could. You could say that. Um, it's not like uh, the uh, what's the term? Uh, the garbage fleet. Like they're a little bit more put together than that. Like I um, let's say you just take a commander. What do you want it to do? Squadrons, ship only, or MSU? And you could just make any sort of combination with any commander like that. Like Ken and I just got done um, when season four ends on the channel. There will be every single commander inside two seasons of our content which is like 10 episodes and then we're going to switch so by next summer we're going to have every single commander both of us commanding a different list with different ideas with that jesus that sounds this sounds complicated but before before i forget and before sorry fox i know i'm totally stepping on your toes and my bad but you you got to tell us how you and ken met ken gave us his version of the story i want your version of the story so Ken actually gave the version of the story. Um, like I was saying, like I owned everything in Armada, multiple copies, and just didn't have anyone to play with. And um, I very much so played through people that I saw online. This is actually going to go into one of your guys' other questions of how Ion started. But like I would follow like Masters of the Fleet. Um, I believe there's this guy named Stephen that was out of um, Pennsylvania. He did a lot of streaming early on in Armada, but his channel has been deleted. He deleted it since, so I, I don't know what happened to him. But I would watch people play games and be like, oh, those are good ideas. I'll store them and then, you know, have lists made up that one day maybe I'll play with it. And I was on, I believe, the FFG forums, and someone posted something about being in Oaklawn, which is the town I lived, and they were going to stream a game. I'm like, okay, whatever. And then I found the stream, and I asked them, where they were and it was literally two blocks away from me like if i really wanted to which i don't because there's major intersections like i could walk there and i just didn't know that this store was there because it had just opened so i went there one day and they hooked me up with their armada player that uh was ken and that's how ken and i met juliet whiskey stealing my questions uh i guess we'll skip that one when we get to it anyways next question if you could give advice to the you starting the game, what would it be? That's a hard one. Um, probably do my own thing. And that, that actually just goes into um, like Ion Radio as a whole. We just kind of do our own thing. Like um, we're not necessarily competitive. We can be competitive. We're not necessarily just casual, but we can be casual. We can make jank lists and things like that. And it's find out what you enjoy about the game and then run with it. For me, making lists that are just all over the place is what I enjoy about the game. So like, if I could get there at an earlier time period, <laughs> I think I would have enjoyed the game for longer, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Um, I, I absolutely agree. I think uh, people sometimes get caught up in flying the most competitive thing, or you know, they see a fleet, and um, then they, they fly that for like three years. And if that's what you enjoy, then do that. But also, like, there's so much to explore in this game. Like, branch out, you know, see what's there. If you've never flown squad heavy, if you've never done MSU, like Kellorn, um, if you've never done... Um, wait, 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 wait. Are we... I, I've flown MSU before. I just... Just because I haven't flown it against you or with you doesn't mean I've never flown it. Okay, yeah. I, I don't believe that. But all right. Um, <laughs> you, do you really expect someone to be three-time world champion and not know how to fly MSU? Jesus Christ, are you getting in on this too? If they're a fake three-time <laughs> world champion, I do. <laughs> uh, the, the, fu the funny thing about what you said, John, is like I, I really enjoy making lists too. And like I'll sit there and, and just, you know, in, you, you brought up on one of your podcasts that you'll like wake up in the middle of the night and grab your phone and make a list because you had an idea. I, I was like, oh shit, I've done that many times. Uh, and But the big problem is that I don't have time to play all the ideas that I have. And like, I have a whole bunch of lists ideas that are just kind of sitting there in my Ryan Kingston fleet builder. And I, there's no way that I'm going to be able to play them. I 
I have way more lists than I will ever be able to play. And like even way more lists than I'll ever be able to play even on the channel. Like, so Ken and I are pretty much done recording for the rest of this year, 2022. And then we have planned out lists for the first half of next year. And that's just the list that I've thrown out there so far, because most of it um, is uh, just me. Like, like when I get assigned, like, let's build a Sato list. Well, I have four Sato lists. I have to come up with which one I want to put on. And that, that becomes really annoying because I want to get all of them out. I just do not have enough time to do it. Matt, you want to take us into the top eight discussion at Gen Con? Sure. Yeah, let's do it. Um, so we... Well, do we want to start? Where do we want to start? We want to start with faction. We want to start with stats because I can do that. Let's do some stats. Yeah, if huh? you want to. Uh, I, 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 maybe we can start with just some general impressions for, from John about what day two was shaping up to be after day one. I know you guys had to start out really early. Uh, did that have any effect on on how the day was going to go uh, in terms of were you guys oh, a bunch of people still fire, tired and whatnot when you started? Like, what was it? Sound seven, seven thirty, 30, something like that? It was a very early morning, but um, one of the reasons why we had to do that is um, there was a hard out per Gen Con at four o'clock. And as you know how long Armada tournaments typically go, we were going to be hard pressed against the time even starting at seven o'clock to be able to get out of there by that time. So um, part of me is like very, very thankful we didn't do four rounds the the night before because then we could actually go out, have dinner and then get back to the hotel room with enough time to try to sleep. Cause I think I had to wake up at like five 30 in the morning. So Ken, I felt like a kid Ken dropped me off at the convention and then went back to the hotel room. Um, that's how early of a morning it was. So Fox, when we were looking at the, at this kind of the stats that we put together here for, for this, what kind of stood out to you the, uh, at first glance of, you know, just what, what people were playing and, and how they were playing it. The the two biggest things that have stood out to me looking at looking at these fleets. Um, number one, the faction spread is ex- very much identical to what we're seeing in top eights uh, across the world. Pretty much, uh, five rebel, one imperial, one gar, one separatist. It's like you know, eight months ago, everyone got on the uh, everyone finally got on board the train of wow, it looks like Rebels have a lot of answers to a lot of the things people are complaining about right now. Uh, it's something, Keller, and you and I have talked about actually a lot. Where And I've said it on the Discord several times. Like Everyone's complaining about Onagers, but who's taking the commanders that are really, really good against Onagers? And um, we're starting to see people get real comfortable with that. And then the other thing is um, my golden rule of 575 is holding up pretty well. So that's what stood out to me. I'm just saying. Fair enough. Uh, John, I, when talking about faction split for a second, you know, we, for a very long, long time, we saw uh, Imperials be quite dominant in the kind of the tournament space, but it really feels like it, that, you know, with, you only had, you had quite a few Imperials in the full field, pretty close to like 30 or 40%, pretty equal to the total rebels in the field, but only one of them made the top eight. Are Imperials kind of in the downswing? I think right now the Imperial is still trying to find its identity. Um, We have this weird like two year gap of like competitive play because of, you know, pandemic and things like that. And inside of that, two new factions were released. So there's a lot of information to digest. And 1.5 hurt a lot of the things that the Imperials did. Um, we have a change to demo. We have a change to how black crits go because the empire for a long time was very much so we're going to get into your face and brawl with you. We have the elimination of price, elimination of pass um, mechanics, um, all of that kind of, and then like even just evade being able to work at um, close range now. Like there's a lot of things that have changed that the that's how the Imperials played between the last time we were having a lot of tournaments and now and i think the imperials are figuring out how to do that because if you look at um like hanover like the, the empire it almost looks like a copy paste from uh the like 2019 like i was looking at the sloan list like i have pretty much played this it just has some uh updated cards to it from um the newer stuff and i think we're seeing the empire go into that more so 
Yeah, it's becoming clear. Like back in 2019, um, ISDs were the king of single activation power. You know, you had price, like you said, you had price. There were the, you know, the seven act. Like I flew a seven activation BT Avenger fleet. Like, and, and everybody knew when you went to a tournament that those ISDs could bear down harder than any other piece in the game. Um, we've definitely, I think those fleets are coming back in vogue. And I like that. Like you said, in Hanover, that fleet was beautiful. I loved it. Uh, I think people are recognizing that the ISDs um, aren't dead. They, there's just a lot more, there were a lot more exciting things that other factions had to bring. But I think people are coming back to and remembering like, well, I mean, four squadron active or five squadron activations with expanded hangar bay. And now all the salvo that you can bring like ISDs have a lot to offer. And especially with the old school Sloan makeup, I, I, I think empire is ready for a reawakening. I think also think boarding trooper Vader is due for some awesome usage, but um, I've gotten a lot of leverage out of Shriv. Uh, to, to your point about that and the uh, important to prepare is even better. The, I guess one thing I wanted to t- take your, both you, John and, and Fox and whiskey, what your temperatures were on. I saw somebody assert in discord uh, the, uh, this week that PDICs is killing Imperials. And I was, I thought that was a pretty extreme take. So I actually kind of said the same thing on our podcast. And um, if you look at Imperial fighters and what they typically roll, and Imperial fighters were always kind of behind the curve for um, anti-ship fighters. Like, they're really good at killing other squadrons, but they've always been lackluster at killing ships. And that's why you see, like, Sloan come out. Sloan's ability is so that they can get that reroll on the critical to try to get a hit. Well, you're only 50% chance of getting a hit anyway with most of the Imperial squadrons because they're blue non-bomber. And then... PDIC comes in and it says from when I pick up a dice to it actually hits you, I only really have a 25% chance that I'm going to get any sort of hit in. And that really, really limits those fighters because at one point, as soon as you kill their squadron ball, you need to kill their ships. And when you're like rolling less than 25% because of a def- like a defensive card that allows you to reroll it, that really, really hamstrings you. I think PDIC killed old school fleet building concepts for Sloan, but I think some people are finding ways to work around it. I don't, uh, you know, they're like, for instance, the, the Hanover fleet, Peter's fleet, um, uh, you know, the usage of, of reserve hangar decks, um, it's to get those fighters back out. That's an interesting concept. So you can, the, the sheer amount of act, attacks you can do kind of makes up for that 25% reduction. Uh, some people are, are uh, combining, fire sprays they're getting decimators which is a mistake oh my god decimators are so bad i i I, it was a hard it was hard listening to the podcast last week without being able to contribute i'm sorry ken but decimators are so bad um you know but people are getting creative and i think sloan list building was too easy really i think pdic's makes it a lot more interesting if you want to make it work the way you need it to one thing I, i think about sloan um is is that when when I'm using those the you know the non bombers for Sloan, I'm usually all I care about is trying to I'm really going for accuracies to kill your tokens, and I don't care about the damage so much. Um, the damage is just kind of bonus if you get it. Right, but just at this point now, you have an ISD that needs to be able to push squadrons. It needs to be able to maneuver. It needs an engineering to redo its ECM, and it needs to do a con fire to do gunnery teams there's a lot of moving parts to just get it to function baseline. So even if you were able to go in there and flip their tokens, Avenger is not there anymore to just automatically, you know, smite the ship. So you need additional damage from fighters to help you chip ships down, especially with um, like the newer factions all having salvo and a lot of the ships being able to take salvo now having one like Imperial Star Destroyer and then trying to flip all the tokens, there's too many tokens to flip with like a five activations. You would need accuracies on everything. It, it just makes it really, really difficult. Not impossible, just very difficult. Whiskey, uh, I think you wanted to say something? Uh, yeah, no, I'm good. Excellent. <laughs> uh, Fox, where do we want to go from here uh, with the, with the, the, the top eight stats? 
<laughs> yeah, let's let's run down some um, some of these general stats we've been following. Um, so activations. Let's talk about that. We so I'm going to run down uh, the all the top eight, starting from first to eighth. Activations were three, four, six, three, three, four, three, and four. So lots of threes, a couple fours, uh, one six, one uh, really great pure MSU uh, fleet. Three seems to be king of the day. And honestly, I, I think that the, the point there is two, if you're thinking of bringing two ships, it's probably too few to really leverage the pass token element of the game. Um, but three ships seems to be doing really, really hot right now. Uh, how do y'all feel about that? So, you know, I, I was building, <clears throat> I was building a few fleets this weekend, you know, just trying to get back in the groove because I'm trying to go to at least one of it before I die. Um, and I, I just got one specific question because this is where my noobishness for all you noobs in the back, pay attention. When we talk about activations, right? So I got my main ships and then am I also counting? What what else am I counting for my activations? Because I'm trying to go by your golden rule and it's not working because I don't have enough ships. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's literally just your ships. So, um, and the golden rule is really the, the whole point of the golden rule is if you want to leverage that aspect of the game, that para fleet stat, that's at least the number you need to hit. So, if you want to leverage the idea that you can have more activations than someone, you need at least five. Typically, the right hand of God said that this is the golden rule. Therefore, it is the <laughs> standard, and I will hear nothing. I said nothing it was else. God, what do you, what was what do you think, John? <laughs> We're bypassing. We're bypassing the. We're bypassing the right hand of God. John, what do you think? Um, I I was there with three, and that's because I couldn't put any more activations in my ship with how many squadrons I have. Um, I feel a lot of times like Imperial settled between sometimes two, which is too low, to four. Rebels are somewhere from three to like five, and same with um, CIS and Gar. They're like in that three to four range. All the factions right now very healthily live at a three to four activation you can step outside of that but you're going to be giving up some other part of your fleet to um get higher than that or just go in pure msu i feel like that you, you, right now the the absolute mainstays are going to be you have one big ship and two and two support ships or you have you have two kind of decent combat ships and uh and then a kind of couple and then a couple of support ships and squadrons like I, I feel like that's the way that a lot of these fleets are going is like you see a lot of people building around a big tough ship you know either in gar or in um in the rebels or an isd for for the imperials and even the even the the cis people you see them building around you know a really tough star frigate uh, cause I, 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 you know, you, you, it may be a medium base box, but your star frigate's way tougher than your large base in your, in your fleets. Yeah. I, I think the CIS kind of break that trend only slightly because of what you just said. Like the, the star frigate is, uh, especially with Watt and all the, it's upgrade suite, it's able to take a lot more than you would anticipate. So, but I agree. Like even my, even my high, heavy squad separatist fleet is a recusin, a muni and a, and a gazanti. Like it's, that standard formula of a couple big activations, a small support ship, and then squads. I think we're all trending in that direction. The The deployments uh, bear that out too. Uh, deployments were, this is a lot of sevens, seven, 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 six, six, seven, four. So um, my golden rule of hey, seven. There's a reason why if the four was at the bottom. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> you're not able to see a lot. Uh, uh, yeah, you're out deployed by three a lot of the time in that spread. But um, I mean, if, if you're not bringing, I I honestly think the squad game right now might have a lot to do with just being able to put your few ships in the right spots later than your opponent. You know, John, what do you think, man? Um, One of the things that I've said before is that you don't necessarily win on deployment, but you can very much so lose on deployment. And, Having not enough activation or deployments so that you're all on the table and they haven't put any of their main pieces down really, really hurts you. 
Man, I really like this guy, Fox. Like he, he espouses a lot of the things I say. Like I, I uh, John, I, I love to say that there are a lot of places where you can lose a game of Armada. You can lose a game of Armada while you're building the the list. You can lose it. Uh, well, when you you know you choose your your uh whether or not you're going to go first or second. You can lose it when you choose an objective. You can lose it as deployment. <laughs> you can lose it while you're maneuvering. And uh, you know, so I really like that because uh, it it really kind of lines up with the way that I see Armada. Whiskey, what you got, buddy? The further and further we get into this interview, the more and more I realize we need to kidnap John and bring him down here. He sounds like he would fit into our play groups very well because everything he's said thus far is something that I've either heard from you, Kalorn, or you, Omega. So, you know, I don't know if he's listening to y'all, or y'all listening to him. But there's some suspicious shenanigans going on here, and I don't like it. But thank you, John. I appreciate for you giving me that little good tidbit of information. Appreciate you. No problem. All right, let's move into bids. Let's talk about bids because, holy cow, um, we actually have a lot to talk about with this. The bid um, wars have begun. Oh, my gosh. So this is the grossest we've seen so far. Let's go <laughs> from top to bottom. It's 389, 400, 387, 390, 387, 400, 392, and 399. Um, so John, John, did what? you expect to win every single bid, or, or were you surprised that two people all bid you? Um, I knew that the chances of someone outbidding me were there, but the people that were outbidding me were bidding for first. That that was my my guess. Did uh you because you played the Rebel MSU player Jason, right? That the is SRS? correct. Did, was he bidding for first or was he bidding for second? That was one thing I didn't I was not clear on. He is bidding because he can play either, and he will just bid and choose whichever does not benefit you. So he chose so, second against you, I assume? Yes, and his objectives are terrible when you just want to keep your Starhawk on the board. He had, like, most wanted, no thank you. He had that migration one, which I don't want to feed him, like, you know, 120 points-ish per turn. And then um, he had... Um, abandoned mining facility and i'm like i guess that's the least of the terrible options against this list but i'm like why don't we just play my objectives i know how to play my objectives fox i, I bet you uh, you're you're right on board with somebody wanting to play your your uh your abandoned mining facility i yeah i i just passed away and then came back to life abandoned mining facility please i want to play him oh my gosh yeah holy cow yeah that's so not great is it it's funny, John, because uh, Fox loves abandoning mining facility with his CIS fleets, and he played. You played abandoned mining facility three times at LSO, right, Fox? And every single time, it was somebody else's objective. Yeah, I was. Well, I played it. I played it twice. Two times on uh, on day uh, on day two, and I was at, as first player. And I just I, I didn't flip the objective, but it was like we weren't even playing an objective. Like uh i don't know it's it's my fleet is very very strong against amf and so it was really funny to see i was so giddy as a little schoolgirl just jumping up and down like yay so yeah i i i said it um once i don't remember where it's either when ken and i are playing or somewhere else but you can't go to a competition without knowing how to deal with advanced mining or abandoned mining because it's either you have it in your list and you're going to run into someone like you who's going to just raid you the entire time so you can't do it, or you're going to have someone that's flipped it. It's like a good objective, but I, I want to say it's one of the easier ones to flip into like a non-objective. Yeah, and that's 100% correct. Yeah, there, there are some uh, interdictors is another example uh, where it's it's easy to, to flip it because you can just move that cloud away. Or mines, like proximity mines are becoming more popular. Um, it's it's often chosen as the safe one if you don't have an option or you've got a lot of ships. But holy cow, if you happen to run against a fleet that's got a really good idea against it, it, it can get really bad really fast. So it yeah, it really depends on who you're going against. And I, I feel like John, when you know the way you described that game against Jason, like he didn't really go in saying, I'm going to focus on mining the abandoned mining facility and just go for points. He actually tried to kill you, which I mean, whether or not you know, in the moment, what, what the right decision there is, I don't know. And I wasn't there and maybe you have a better idea, but I feel like he could have said, I'm not going to play this game against you. I'm just going to mine my tokens and gotten a pretty decent win. 
No, I actually think the the best play for AMF is you, you just need to have a plan to farm it for the first two rounds, really. Because once combat starts proper, you, you don't want to be spamming too many repair commands. I think that's where a lot of people get it wrong, is they think it's a pure farming objective. And it, it really isn't. It's one that gets you out ahead fast. And then you need to be the one staging combat or using that to your advantage. Um, it's also almost like a it's a reverse co- uh, contested outpost. Like I get to see where your cloud goes and then I can be reactionary. So I 100 percent agree with everything you just said there. Um, it, it really it really is like you should just use it to farm a couple of points so that when you run across the board, you get one of your ships back for free. That That's how I feel like it should be used. And that's pretty much how Jason did it. He farmed like two, three turns because he was swinging in station side to come flank me. And I'm just like, I'll gather some tokens because I have nothing better to do right now just to mitigate how many points um, he was scoring on me. It is funny when you you talk about a little bit about flipping somebody's objectives over and seeing one, you're like, oh, I really want to play that uh, and getting happy about it. I, I feel that way about surprise attack. Like I when I see that in an opponent's uh, list of objectives, unless they have interdictors, I really want to play that. Um, that's actually one of the reasons why I have Ahsoka in my list is it makes it so then um, I'm pretty much surprise attack proof. And... My my dream is that you don't want me to take surprise attack after you have it in your list if you make me go uh, first. And I can like put that Starhawk almost in your deployment zone. And then I'm not really afraid of taking that um, Onager first shot at speed zero if you interdict me because you have to give me a token usually unless you're playing Tarkin, which who plays Tarkin for the Empire. Um, so like you Hondo, you give me a token, Ahsoka changes it to a nav, and then I'm already moving. And... I'm fine with surprise attack. Let's do this. Let's rumble on your side of the board earlier. That that sounds great to me. I, I was about to get in fighting position because I'm like, what do you mean? Who takes Tarkin? What what do you what do you mean by that, sir? And then you said imps. I'm like, oh, okay, I really don't care. <laughs> Gar all the way, baby. Garbage. It's funny how the the Admiral almost does the same thing between um uh the two uh factions, but he fits so much better in the um, Gar faction than he does the Imperial faction. See, I haven't seen him in Imps yet. Uh, I haven't run across him yet, so I'm questioning how that would go. I would like to have that match. I should schedule that sometime. Fox, you've played Tarkin a couple times uh, for you know, with Imperials. Uh, I've seen you have a couple ideas, uh, and along with Tag, right? Tarkin and Tag, TNT, man. Absolutely. Yeah, those guys are, uh, what's the word? Trash. But I love playing them. I'm just kidding. They're actually really good. But am I joking? I don't Jesus know. Christ. I'm going to confuse everybody. Jesus. What is my opinion about those two commanders? I don't know. Who knows? Uh, that, that's what the T stands for, and that's amazing. <laughs> Man, no, that that, uh, that just like swerved very quickly off the rails. Uh, John, I did want to talk to you for a second about Ozl. And I know Ken talked to us a little bit about that Ozl is kind of like the hallmark of the of the chicago guys but i mean we saw a lot of ozzel on day one and one in the only imperial list that made it was an ozzel list and actually took second after you like how did that what was your thought on on, on ozzel in the kind of rebel uh, you know the rebel heavy list that we saw at at gen con and then ozzel versus potential onager matchups uh and, and using him as an onager counter um, so all three of the Ozzel players were Chicago players. Um, and Ozzel, I really, really like him. And I think he works well with MSU Imperial. And he also can tie into um, fleets. Like I, we were talking about earlier with the ISD. Like the ISD wants to do all the commands, right? It wants to nav it, wants to engineer it, wants to push squadrons if you have squadrons that aren't rogue. And it wants to confire to trigger gunnery teams. That's too many things. Ozzel relieves you of needing to do any navigation. He just allows you to adjust speed. And I think that's where he fits into the ISD. Um, Jumping over to the Onager um, list that made it to day two, Nick used to run two Architens, and it was more of an MSU with Rogue type list. And he just recently switched over to the Onager and that was because the um, Architens exploded too easily, and he gave too many points away of that. And his firepower is actually not in the Onager, it's in his fighters. Like, if you let his fighters get near you, he will kill you really, really fast. So 
he has complete control then of his speed in running away with Ozzel without having to worry about, do I just stack navs? Can I put concentrate fire on that? That's where um, I think the power of Ozzel is. It's just that versatility. Sound familiar, Fox? I mean, that that was more or less your MO last year, right? Oh my gosh. Yeah, Ozzel, Ozzel uh, he's really good. What I find is he's really good at controlling engagement. I can determine exactly what ranges I want to be engaging you at, uh, which makes complete sense what you're talking about. Like, Onagers would love that. They'd love to speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down, you know, keep things in the right ranges with the right dice. And then when it gets too hot, accelerate. Um, also, Ozzel is really good against raid. And there are a couple of really good raid machines going on right now. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. I really mean like TF. Um, and th- there are some other mechanics that are bringing, ra- like we just talked about surprise attack. Um, Ozzel doesn't care about nav raid. So um, it's, yeah, he's, he's really, I love him. He's really good. People sleep on him Don't a lot. Don't let him lie to you people. He, he's totally patting himself on the back. Well, pat himself on the back. I I really like Hustle, and um, like if I were to rank like current like um, Imperial power, like you know, for commanders, I put Ozzel almost top three, just because of his versatility. He can work with almost any any fleet, and like you're saying, like going from like zero with an Onager to theoretically speed four with engine text, you. You can ozzle to one, you can nav token to two, you can nav dial to three, and then engine text to four. So you can go from zero to four to get out of dodge really, really fast with Ozzel. Ozzel in the top three commanders for Imperials. John and I are going to get along just fine. Oh my gosh. I would 100% <laughs> agree. Hey, John, John, you just need to sell your house in in uh, in in Chicago and just come live in Texas with us because clearly you belong here. I was just about to say he's lost. My my wife has this rule. Um, we're pretty much as south as she would l- want to live. She doesn't like spiders or snakes or anything like that. And we still live in a high enough like frost area that all of that dies at a certain point of the year. So if you guys want to come north, you're welcome to come north. I don't think I'll ever be able to go south, though. Uh, you're missing out. Uh, I, I grew up in, in northern Michigan, and I, I like the winters down here a lot better than I like the winters in Michigan. <laughs> but how about the... Uh- melt you summers uh we just stay in the house with the air conditioning on man when, when your houses aren't exploding from uh the wrath of god yeah well i mean the, there is the wrath of god aspect from the complete and utter wrath of gall gall god i'm playing destiny leave me alone anyway <laughs> squads I, I yes I'm, I'm taking over for i'm taking over here just for half a second squad jesus take the wheel jesus take the wheel sorry squads super heavy all tournament long john what's your take on this is this just what it is now are we expected to just come in swinging in a fighting i think squads have always been there and there's really fast way to lose a game is if you ignore that squadrons exist don't tell me that (laughs) that hurts my feelings so john John, i I wanted to to kind of get, get into a minute for why did imperial squads not do well because there was a number of imperial heavy squad lists in the day one kind of spread but only nick made it with his ro- with a, a largely rogue based list and you know most of the the rebel squads were rogue based uh i mean what what was going on there Do you, is it, it like we talked a little bit previously about that rogue squads were good but we've all we've also had some people tell us that you know there are limitations to it. So what do you think went on and and why it went down the way it did? So I can only speculate on that. I pretty much rode I killed rebels on rebel action all the way to day two. Um, I only played one imperial list the entire time, and they only had four interceptors as um, a speed bump. Um, so I, I didn't get to really focus in and see how people were playing those other lists. But what my guess is is that. Um, like what we were talking about with the ISD, there's so many things that the ISD wants to do. It becomes difficult to push all those squadrons. I know one of my favorite lists, just because I love janky lists like this, um, one of the Chicago guys brought, like, it was something ungodly, like 10 TIE bombers. Well, 10 bombers. That guy was awesome. <laughs> so is, many bombers. I know, I know. Like, if you, like, this is, like, if you don't have an answer for squadrons, you're dead. Like, you're dead in one turn. Um, 
but like it becomes difficult to push that many squadrons and becomes like very difficult to move them to where you need to like 10 bombers don't actually fit all in an arc so you're like attacking multiple arcs to get them all in or you know like fading in and out like that becomes difficult and then like sloan type lists when they're up against rogue that are like beefy generics so like sloan's really really good at killing aces and now with an ace limit of four some of her power against squadrons is diminished because those accuracies are just blanks instead of you know like now you can't scatter and you explode so i I think that has something to do with it and like when you're looking at like almost every rebel list is like all like lando slash dash slash shara slash yt 2400s and then you put another squadron in for taste like there's a lot of beef there in rogue that just attacking it with tie interceptors isn't necessarily gonna finish him off immediately that that's kind of my take fox what, uh, what's your take on the on the squad situation that we saw it here in gen con fox is underwater right now why is he underwater right now He's underwater. Just he, just trust me. He he's swimming. He he's swimming and it's not working. So now he's just become a creature of the deep. Now he's just walking across the bottom of the ocean. We'll see him in about ten to twenty minutes. Maybe next year. It, who knows? Fox will be okay. So what we're going to do instead is move on to the Starhawks shenanigans that was going on. Fair enough. So, John, we've talked about the farming Starhawk 134 concept uh, almost ad nauseum on this podcast uh, after I uh, took it to to TXO earlier this year. But I noticed you took boarding teams, which is certainly not something that we talked about uh, when 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 I was discussing uh, the way I played it. Um, So when I made the farm hawk in the past, um, it was right after. I did this like Imperial. I had like three Lambda shuttles and I just farm Ken on the channel for like, it was something ungodly. It was like 24, 26 tokens or something like that. And he told me that it was the most annoying list that he had ever played. And I said, hold that. Give me one second. So I took the Starhawk list that I had and he knew the, you know, competition stuff. And I put it with farming objectives with two VCXs. And then I'm like, and on top of that, um, because I played a lot of like Sloan and Avenger stuff. And I'm like, I'm going to put boarding troopers on it because now it's like everything you hate all in one list. And then that kind of stuck that that's kind of why it's there um, is a half joke. And then it's really good at killing other Starhawks because Starhawks with Agate, like you get into this who can whittle each other's tokens down first. And when I just get to flip all your tokens, you win that match. There, I, I actually played uh, Ryan Becker's um, boarding team's command SSD with an onager list. Did you ever see that one? I have seen that. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I played that list with my farm hawk before I took it to, to TXO, and uh, I was doing great. I was doing great, uh, and then he he flipped. Uh, I was in the side arc of the of the of the SSD. And he flipped my tokens and I had to burn a couple, but I was doing okay. And then he flipped a comms noise on me and slowed me down to speed zero. And I was like hanging on for dear life on turn six. He activated with the SSD first and hurt me real bad. I was on like four health or something or like two or three health. I was in, he had his honor lined up to absolutely blow me away. And I he moved the SSD and moved it out of the the uh, way of the onager, and I was able to double hit the onager in the face and kill it because I had advanced gun. <laughs> and he got really mad because he was like, "I had you dead to rights." It was I was like, "Man, the dice saved me that time." Oh, that's so frustrating for him, and you're probably like just sweating on your side of the table. It was it was awful. <laughs> But I mean, you know, if, if I hadn't gotten the comms net, I still had some tokens left and I would have probably been okay. Uh, but man, that comms net was just like, oh, that is the really bad luck of the draw. But that boarding team's concept is really nasty. Yeah, my idea for um, actually using it and not just as a joke um, is there's a lot of fleets that want to close in tight on you. And a lot of them will choose something that's not... Um, um, advanced gunnery if they're planning on killing you like maybe i can kill you before you farm all the toys and then as soon as the starhawk's dead it's dead so you could no matter how many tokens you get you're gonna still lose which is always a scary thought but like it just gives me that little bit extra of you don't want to be near me 
that I need to keep people from coming near me. <laughs> it, it's mainly a scare tech, and I think I only used it uh, once the entire entire tournament, and it was against an ISD that already had uh, tokens spent, so I just got rid of it right before I killed it. But, like, it's mainly a deterrent, and then if you run into someone that wants to run into you, you can kill them, and then, like, you know how Onagers love to do that? We'll sit in front of you for one turn and then disappear. On that one turn, you can exhaust all their tokens, then hit them twice. That that that's really the the plan. If you can land the the double arc, or if you do have advanced gunnery, it's just just dead. Here's all your tokens gone after the first shot, and then you eat the second. So I think that's a great spot to come in at. There's been a not so minor meltdown over farm hawks and various discords, uh, but fox personally feels like is just going to spur another meta shift uh without giving away your future plans uh what were some of the things that you were afraid of coming up against while playing farm hawk um oddly enough one of the things that i'm most worried about is um martuk msu with patriot's fist because if they can get all those red dice on you at one on one turn early then you're gonna melt through all your tokens and all your health really fast um other things like just msu in general just because i'm one ship and you can just fly off to the other corner or you can like the akbar list with jason he he almost killed me he he was he needed like really one or two more good shots on me and i was gone like those are the fleets that i worry about the most is honestly lots of red dice from long range well truthy managed to to kill my farm hawk when we played a test game uh for so uh for him with his grievous list that uh grievous msu it was three hard cells um a a patriot fist and then a bunch of squads including three hyenas which uh got when they roll really well they're really really nasty uh in terms of burning up your your tokens um the other one that i would add to that list john is act is is radis uh i you know i um Ryan himself did uh, Ryan Becker did really well against uh Rubens uh farm hawk in, in, on day 2 and was actually able to kill it with his Radis drop uh even though he used uh it, it was overload pulse right and board, it was overload pulse and boarding troopers as well y- yes it was um that's a scary list i did not want to face that at all on day 2 i'm like ah that's going to straight up kill me there's nowhere i can hide a big giant starhawk and you're going to just come in and wipe out all my tokens but i could wipe out all of his tokens and we'll just have a slug fest yeah that that, that certainly is what it would turn into and i, I you know i mean it, it's funny because like I, we talked a little bit about like I, I do feel like msu and radis are kind of what's coming next in the meta uh just in general in response to uh the the, the starhawks that have been out there uh but i also feel like you you have a couple of different kinds of potential radices. You have the the radices that are built around dropping um, you know profundity uh, with uh, with another ship inside, and then you have kind of the the MC eighty uh, battle cruiser star cruiser radis lists. Do you have a, a kind of hand like? I, but at the same time, like I don't feel like the the battle cruiser star cruiser radis lists are really that big of a threat to a farm hawk. I would agree. The overload pulse and boarding troopers is really what hammered that list home. Um, if you had the points, the problem is it's always with Radis this like risk reward of can I survive long enough to make that Radis drop or I'm going to be that shame person that's going to get wiped out on turn one. Um, and so the last competitive um, Radis fleet I've built, I had the um, MC-80 being the Radis ship to drop the um, MC-75 and a hammerhead on someone. And that's how I found the most success with it. I, I think dropping the profundity is better than dropping a Liberty onto someone. And so I would agree with you on that. Yeah. And, and I, I tried that uh, Liberty flagship as well. The problem with it the, there is that, that I found is that I ended up running into the profundity quite a bit. Um, and that was just kind of suboptimal. So I, I've kind of moved into this uh, using Foresight as my Radis uh, flagship, along with a GR75. And it just gives you a little bit more flexibility in terms of like where you go after you drop. I've tried that as well, actually, too. I feel that um, what I was keen with the um, Liberty is to kill um, Superstar Destroyers. So a lot of times I would try to get the Liberty right into the front of it and then 
um, to the side the um, profanity. So then I could just ram into their Super Star Destroyer. But with a Starhawk, it's a it's a different way to kill it. Like you still have to treat it almost like a Super Star Destroyer in the way you um, kill it, but it's different. You know what I mean? I can believe you. Uh, well, no, I actually I do not know what you mean. Kaloran probably knows what you mean, but I have. I am the noob. I am fresh. I am. I am clean and sparkly. And yes, Kaloran, do you have anything to add to his statement before we continue? No, I, I think that, like I said, I, I I look forward to where the meta goes from here, and whatever that is going to end up being, whatever people answers co- uh, are going to be. I mean, like I, I and I, I'm curious, John. I don't really intend to play Starhawk again at this point. Um, I just I don't see a way for that to go forward in the meta and continue to succeed when people know it's now now people know it's coming now you know uh yeah like we've uh talked online it frustrated me that you were using it before gen con because i was going to be using it gen con i'm like i don't need people to know the secret of this farm hawk it was really really annoying like why would you do that um and now that it's hilarious because we both came out kind of like we never talked about it before it happened you know like we came up with it independently yeah and like i I don't want to say it's a one-shot pony but like people are going to adjust to it and the list goes down so hard if you know how to fight it like i always tell people it's either i'm getting a six five a ten one or i'm one ten those are my three options like there's nothing else really in between so as soon as people are good at countering it then it's such a liability to take i pray to god all of you out there taking notes because they are giving away the secret sauce. They are they are handing out all of the juicy tidbits for you to shift the meta. But while we wait for the answers from the community of where this meta is going, what we can do is get some answers for these hot takes. Because you all know what time it is. It is time for Hot Take 30, where we ask our wonderful host and our interviewee some of the most outrageous outlandish and most questionable of questions first we're going to start off with big john the true john you got your mute un- mic un- mic mute unmited mic unmuted yeah i'm just Are laughing you- here <laughs> armada it, it, it needs more official game modes at least more than just the 400 points what what's your hot take on this technically there's three official uh um modes you have task force which is the small 200 point games you have standard which is 400 and then you have um sector fleets which are 600 plus um i would like to see more of those used widely um i know ken and i on the channel we do a modified version of monster trucks which is a sector fleet at 800 which is a lot of fun just big ships crashing into each other And then we also do our own different style. It just so happens to be taking place in March and we call it, this is madness. Like, you know what C3PO says, it has nothing to do with any other sort of sports or basketball, but we take 300 point tournaments on a three by three mat and we just crash them in and they're not our list. So it's kind of like a sprint to the top to see which list lasts. So there are other formats out there. Um, I would like to see more of them supported. Uh, three-time world champion Kalorn, what's your take? I, you know, I, I this is one of those things where I I come from a background where I played like Warhammer 40k, and every single tournament in Warhammer 40k was like, oh, this is going to be a thousand point tournament. This is going to be a fifteen hundred point tournament. This is going to be a twenty five hundred point tournament, and like it was very very interchangeable, and it was going to be what you were going to play was really dependent on who wanted to run what and what that individual tournament is doing. And I feel like the, the Warhammer 40 K like organized play people really left that in the hands of the people running the tournaments. And I really don't feel like that's the case in Armada. I feel like Armada really, you know, the tournament mode quote unquote is the 400 point mode. And the game is really kind of balanced for that mode in a way that it's not balanced. I don't think, for sector fleet so like to support those other modes i almost feel like you need to revamp some pretty core aspects of the game and is that something that you guys have run into running those other modes in kind of a more official capacity john um for us we very much so limit the list and like the this is madness and select lists that would work well with it like 
honestly people that drop in like double largest were like this just wouldn't be fun to record for it so it it spans into more of like minor msue slash here's a big ship with some support type lists and not so much fighter heavy but yeah i would agree with that 400s where it's balanced the best um and as soon as you start going outside of that like some commanders become useless in 800 plus point games and others become like god tier like tarkin actually gets way better in the bigger point games akbar is ridiculous ridiculous at 800 points and then you have my favorite commander who becomes actually useful because he can bring ships and squadron sato sato is god tier in um sector feet lead as well dear lord and heavenly father we come to you today and say please return fox your right hand <laughs> from the bottom of the ocean oh fox <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> this whole podcast is just going to hell i swear to god Fuck. What do you got? Oh, <laughs> oh baby, come on. Can't At do least that. the activations were a lot of sevens and weren't one more six. <laughs> yeah, I know. I need six, six, six on the activations and I would have just poof, like just gone. Fox is gone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you had no idea what you were getting into when you agreed to this interview, John. Oh, my God. Well, uh, the sad thing is I did, and I'm just going with it because it's great. <laughs> my opinion on 400. That. My opinion on 400 points. I'll be honest. I actually, so me as a gamer, I actually enjoy the strain of trying to figure out how to get what I want within 400 points. 400 points is perfect in that, like, I cannot get everything I want, and so I really have to push and strain and work around the things that I can't get in. I like it a lot. I actually don't like higher point play because I can get everything in and I'm like, oh, I can fit in an SSD and an ISD and squads. Like, I, uh, okay. I mean, that's fun. It is cool. It's cool to push those pieces around, but like, I, I don't know. I like the push. I like the, 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 the trying to figure it out to get everything in there. Um, I don't know. So I'm going to steal this for a second then. So what's your guys' opinion on doing what other games have done that um, you have a restricted list for like a season? So you could restrict objectives, you could restrict commanders, you could restrict ships and squadrons and upgrades for just a season. Because I think X-Wing tried that for one of their formats. The, the hyperspace format where the, where you could only take certain things and not other things? I believe I don't really follow it. So that's about yeah, as far it, as I, I go into it. It, it. it was interesting. And like, because they had formal tournaments that were what they called hyperspace, which were the limited list. And then they had formal turn and the things moved in and out of what were hyperspace legal. And then they had extended tournaments, which was everything. I, I think it's a cool idea. I think if you were going to mix things up a bit, I think that that, that works really well. I just think that if you are going to do that, you need to get in the point of, uh, or you need to get into the realm of adjusting points for things in the list. Fox, what do you think? I, I think um, Armada would be really unique in that um, it would introduce a new, it's a really great way to shake up the meta. It's a really good way to convince people to play other commanders and other objectives. I think that's really cool, but it also reveals glaring issues with, uh, certain combos maybe um, but I don't know I think it'd be a really cool idea to do like a like a league where you can where you can't play the top three reds red objectives or the top three blue obje- that would be cool I think you would uh, I don't know I, I, we've never done it but I, I think it'd be neat I think that I would love it and hate it all in the same sentence it's a wonderful idea it's great sounds fun and it's a great way to always shake up just the kind of dullness that ends up falling into any game where it is oh this is what works so i'm just gonna fly this or i'm just gonna do this but i would hate it because i'm still a freaking rookie and i'd be like but i, I really i want to try this one thing one time just let me let me put this let me slide this little piece in here no okay fine <laughs> The the list builder in me would love that, just being able to tool a completely different list all the time, something that you would not see before become verifiable. We're we're coming up there to kidnap you. I'm sorry, it's official now. You're just you're moving to Texas. Just let the wife know. 
that j- just buy a summer home up there or something. Summer home, winter home, summer home, whatever. Just you can move back and forth. It's fine. Anyways, well, wait, sorry, I got to make sure I do this right when we move on. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for returning Fox from the deepest pits of the ocean. Thank you for returning your right hand because he has a question coming up from somebody who i know exactly who it is i just don't feel it's right to say the name because this is always kind of just a uh random pull from the hot take 30 channel but double flotillas are for cowards that would rather run than fight (laughs) fox omega chris is a bad man for saying this out loud uh this is Oh man, I'm the guy that runs double flotilla unironically. Like I actually like the activation padding. I like what they do. I like that there's some utility there. I do think there are points where um it's a mistake and you like in MSU, I don't know if you need double flotilla, but uh, I, they serve if you if they're serving a purpose, I think they're fine. Uh, I also though, I'm totally cool with being a coward. So no, okay, uh, I was about to say, but that wasn't the question. The question <laughs> is, <laughs> try to dance around it. For cowards. <laughs> I tried the, to dance the, the, around the, it. The, the hilarious thing is that John, Fox, and I all routinely run double flotillas, and so I guess uh, so. Uh, John, are you? I'm cool with being a coward. Are you cool with being a coward too? Is it cowardly though to take the most e- point efficient rubble squad pusher? No, it is not. It is just being smart. And you have a double chariot to carry all your valuable commanders that are not commanders, officers. Like, that's not being a coward. That's just playing smart. Mic drop right there. Just, we'll just leave drop. it right there. Oh, my God. <laughs> two, two, two for coward, one for not. Oh, Lord, the Discord is going to be hot tonight. Make sure you join the Discord in the links below. And last but not least, the three soon-to-be four-time champ of the world Kalorn the Imperial Officer Waldar is fine is that accurate? I, yeah that's I, I don't know I, I think Waldar is actually really good and he uh, like I in some ways Waldar is actually better than Torrent uh, because it, it, with with Waldar you can roll re-roll whichever colored dice you want and whereas Torrent's restricted to just blue Torrin does let you do it on 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 ships, which is a which is a big a, a big positive that people get into. But I also think that we're going to start seeing more and more imperial rogues, and which don't have swarm, and can actually benefit from Waldar when we basically lived in a world of Tie Fighters and Tie Interceptors with Sloan constantly. Hold on, John is going to like pop. <laughs> he wants oh my to God. answer this no, question. No, that so is bad. he is so terrible. <laughs> So if you look at most Imperial fleets, this is hot take, so I'm just going all in on it. Um, if you look at most Imperial fleets, oh, most Imperial fleets are running three activations. That means you only get three officers. And this is going to be up on your officer list? You're going to put this on ISD or a anything like that? No, you're, you're not. It needs to be in the front, in the battle, and the Imperial uses their range in their Alpha Strike which will leave him far, far behind, unless you're letting them alpha in on you, which I think is a big mistake. I I just, no, he's not fine. He's still trash. Like, where are you going to put him? On a Gazanti that you're going to run right into him so that it dies? Like, I I don't know. I I would not be taking him. I've seen him on Suppressor with Slicer Tools, and, and, and he works really well in that particular aspect. But Fox is about to tell me I'm wrong too, so, you know, I I'm cool with that. Nope, I have my own isolated hot take about this. You ready for this? Woldar, I hardly know her. That's all I have to say about that. Get out. (laughs) Get get out. (laughs) Get out. Get oh my god. I'm disappointed. You 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 realize Fox, you realize that's going in the intro, right? As I planned the second I saw that we were talking about Woldar. It has been well played. (laughs) Well planned dad joke. Star uh, Star Wars Armada dad joke of 2022, right there, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. This was the Armada podcast. <laughs> John is clapping. For <laughs> <laughs> right here, done, done. That's game. That just that just end the episode here. We're done. <laughs> but no, um, once again, that was the Armada podcast. Thank you for showing up and listening. We uh, re- repost every Friday, Thursday, Friday. I still don't know actually what day we post. Anyways, we post once a week on Thursday or Friday. And 
So make sure you subscribe, download, save it to your browser. I don't care. Just make sure you are here to listen to the shenanigans that goes on. John, the true. Before I let you go, tell us, where can they find you at? You can find me. The easiest place to find us is the YouTube channel, Ion Radio. Um, you can also listen to the podcast that I'm on, Command Stack. You can find it on all of your favorite podcast stuff. Thank you for coming on with us, by the way, John. It was uh, it was great to have you in, and congratulations on your your, your big Adepticon win, which we I don't think we have formally said that you were the winner or not Adepticon, your uh, Gen Con win. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I don't think we formally said that you were the winner of Gen Con, so uh, congratulations on that. For, you get your great plane ticket, right? Uh, they haven't contacted me, so I haven't decided yet if I should fly out of state and then have them fly me back. So we'll see about that. But thank you very much. <laughs> you're, 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 uh, the, you're, uh, I forgot you're like 20 minutes from Adepticon, aren't you? Uh, if I, I live on now the greater, greater Chicagoland area, so it's about an hour for me to get there. So I will need the hotel room for sure, but a flight is a little bit excessive. Fair enough. Well, uh, Fox, we're glad to have you back this week as well after your uh, your hiatus last week. And uh, I, I think you had uh, some things you wanted to tell the our, our adoring fans, right? Oh, um, yeah. Just if you guys are reaching out to me, I recently uh, got promoted, so woohoo, at my job. And I'm, I'm a multi-unit uh, director, so I, I, my life is totally cram-packed. If you guys are reaching out to me on Discord, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm often not finding time to text back my own mother. So, uh, discord is kind of a lower priority at the moment. So I will get back to you guys, but just so y'all know, I know I was talking with a lot of you guys. I didn't fall off the face of the earth. Um, yet if Juliet keeps this up, I might, but we'll see. <laughs> Fox one, you're terrible at this. What he, how he meant to say it was due to life situations it's going to take him a minute. He'll get back to you. He's not ignoring you. He still loves all of the community. We all do. And if you reach out to any of us and we don't immediately respond, it's because, well, real life got in the way. But don't worry. We still do love you. We think about you. And we're going to try to get back to you as soon as possible. Before we hop off, I'm going to try to read this the right way this time because there's a little snippet at the end that's actually kind of important um so forgive me for hitting you with the double whammy actually i'm just gonna hit read the last paragraph um so they've heard some folks still need a little bit more incentive to attend and that's why they wanted us to do this ad they want more people they need more Give them more. Uh, so they're already offering a great deal with the early bird special ticket pricing. So if you use our code, you also get a $5 discount on the tickets. So do it now. Do it early. Do it often. And just make sure you wear protection for everybody's safety. This whole episode is an ad. Yes, it is, Fox. Indeed, it is. For Star Wars Armada, the best tabletop game that you will ever game in your flipping life. Anyways, that's all I really got for tonight, folks. Usually I wouldn't have everybody say that some positive but my only positive message is make sure you drink some freaking water. Remember, fly safe out there. And good night. Thank you for listening to the Armada Podcast. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. In the meantime, keep up with the show on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter at Armada Podcast. Join us on Discord with the link in the show notes. Until next time.